to, to look me in the eye. Same basic rules apply. These lads, they do have it hard. I am allowed to worry. To acknowledge what he did. Do you know what fair it is, bud? No one mess with me. Not with me big brother around. Lords that you did. Just see me as a person who's in command. Look at you, you're miles away. <laughs> Pull up your chair. Closer. 911, what's your emergency? I want him to. I should warn you, Janice. What's going on? I want him to. These tests, they can be can I not see her? invasive. I'm not like the others. Am I? I want him to see that I'm strong. Good evening and uh, welcome to this webinar on restorative justice. My name is Paul Mead and I'm the Artistic Director of Guna Miller Theatre Company. And as part of this year's Dublin Theatre Festival and the support from the Arts Council, the Probation Service and Dublin City Council, we are presenting a new play by Jeff Power called Stronger. Stronger is a story of restorative justice and it's fitting but as part of this festival, we present this webinar with such a distinguished panel. So on behalf of Gunanua, I would like to thank each and every one of the panel for taking part. I would also like to thank Kate and Gerbel at ETF for their help in presenting this. And I'd also like to thank everyone who is viewing here today and hopefully in the future online. And I hope you find the discussion informative and stimulating. And I'd now like to hand you over to the chair of our panel, Tim Chapman who is the chair of the European Forum on Restorative Justice. So now I'd hand over to Tim, thank you. Hi, Tim. Tim, would you like to kick us off? Bear with us, it can take a few minutes. It will come good. Tim, I think you might be hearing us now, are you? Maybe Paul, would you like to come back in and facilitate for a minute? Sure, yes, uh, no problem. Tim seems to be having some uh, technical difficulties there. Um, I'm sure David Durbel will resolve them. So yeah, I suppose what Tim was gonna do to start off with was just to give people a sense of Stronger, the play. You saw the trailer there that played at the beginning of um, this webinar and uh, Stronger was written by Jeff Power, who is here with us today and it is a story uh, of a woman who is raped by her students and goes through the court's process um, and finds it uh, unsatisfactory and I suppose is looking for something more, some more healing or some something else to, to, to help her. And um, she ends up going through a restorative justice practice. So it's a very... Um, interesting play that we've been working on for a number of years and we're so delighted that it's it's in Smock Alley uh, Theatre for the Dublin Theatre Festival and um, we, we've decided to have this uh, webinar in association with the probation service um, to kind of discuss discuss issues that have come up through the play. So um, Tim had prepared a few questions for some of the panel so I might um, introduce you uh to the panel um apologies if i don't get uh, the titles correct but uh, we have uh, ursula fernay from the Pro probation service 
Jeff Power, the author, Nolene Blackwell from the Dublin Rape Crisis Center, uh, Ian Marder from Maynooth University, and Patricia McNamara, uh, who is uh, a judge here in Ireland. So um, perhaps, um, Patricia, would it be worth, would you be happy to answer the question that Tim asked you there uh, before we started? Just before Tim comes in, that you could maybe reiterate the yeah. question and then talk a little bit around it. That would be very great if you could do that. Thank you. Okay, now, am I technically okay? You can hear me? You yeah. are. I'm hearing you and I'm seeing you, yeah. so that's good. Yeah. Let's progress back into this process. Okay. Um, thank you very much for a start to the production team for inviting me along. And I went to see the play last night with um, a younger female, let's put it that way. And uh, we both found it very stimulating and very enjoyable. And the acting was excellent. Excellent, and the production superb. So done for a start to that, and uh, the script. I think Tim was going to ask whether I could see um, restorative justice within our criminal justice system uh, being used in a case such as this. Now, probably Ursula from probation will be able to talk about whether the courts that actually deal with a serious case. Um, of rape uh, that happened in the play, um, whether the restorative justice is used, being used within the criminal justice system in those kinds of cases. Uh, but certainly, I'm in the district court and I use restorative justice, and it is a very, very good process. Um, each case is different, each circumstances is different, and uh, you have to to be very aware of uh, the needs um, and requirements of both the victim and I know the um, the woman in the play last night, the term victim, she didn't want to be anymore and that's perfectly understandable. Um, so we call maybe injured party, if that's what she um, you know, she didn't want to be a victim anymore and I think that's what restorative justice can can do. He was taking a hold of uh, the circumstances that unfortunately had uh, she found herself in and the pain. But also it takes into account um, the rehabilitation of the offender and uh, for an offender to actually have to face the victim of their crime and to be answerable face to face. Um, often far more restorative than a uh, penal sanction. But again, it has to be a voluntary between both parties. It be something that's suitable. And this is where fully trained mediators play a big role um, uh, before it could even come back to the court to see whether uh, restorative justice is something that's going to be suitable for that particular case. So, so I don't know if that would have answered Tim's question question, but that's just from um, the criminal justice perspective. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Patricia. So um, maybe I think it might be interesting to bring in Ursula, just because some of the what Patricia has said uh, falls under your remit. Uh, so maybe you might be interested in answering some of what Patricia has raised there and also has perhaps raised follow through with the question that Tim had asked you to reiterate it. I thought it was interesting around language, that language, obviously, the, the idea of victim or injured party, that language is so crucial. I could even, when Tim was uh, speaking to us earlier, you know, you know, you could see how trained you all are, I suppose, in terms of language and how important that is. Um, but also, and I suppose language is a really important part of theater too. And, um, also, the, the the training that that goes into this 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 area. Uh, so, Ursula, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay, I just want to check the. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, Paul, if it's okay, I'll take it in three bits because I'll do my reaction to the play as well, if I may, and yes. then maybe following on from Patricia's comment, and then the 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 question that Tim posed uh, to me. Um, I suppose you know you can sort of search for adjectives, but certainly the play was very um, powerful and thought-provoking. Um, 
and that was at a, a, a number of, of, of levels. Um, you know, the power of the narrative, the narrative within the play, the narrative and the storytelling that's so much part of restorative justice um, and the way it was staged with the, um, I suppose, parallel juxtaposition of the stories that was happening at the same time. Um, I thought also the, you know, very vividly and uh, it portrayed the, the harm of crime and obviously specifically in sexual violence in this case, but just the not just the harm to the person who's at the receiving end, but that ripple effect um, that goes, you know, right across families and, and communities. Um, and in terms of the, um, the process and the um, experience of the victim and the victim's voice, and I accept that there's challenges with the use of the word but the a phrase that struck me and i know some people may have yet to see the play but was the words of jan when the criminal procedure had completed and, and that in the play is managed efficiently but it's not all done for her and you know she says uh, she still has to fix herself inside and that really captured you know a lot of the essence of restorative justice um and there is there is hope throughout the play and we might reflect on that later on as another discussion point in response to um or just following on from patricia's point around referrals um our experience is that there are referrals coming from the courts um in relation to restorative justice at um pre-sanction report stage where there's a request for an assessment for restorative justice, but they are generally for other types of cases and not for sexual violence. On the other hand, the unit that I work in is the Restorative Justice and Victim Services Unit. So we offer a direct point of contact to victims um, where the perpetrator is known to ourselves and they may contact us and uh, uh, have a number of queries, sometimes to ask us to explain what it is that we do in relation to managing the rehabilitation of offenders. But we do get re requests for uh, restorative justice interventions initiated by victims. They are um, a small number, but they are, I could say, exclusively in the context of sexual violence. Um, and often at the point where um, perpetrators may be due for release into the community. So that's really um, the, our experience to date. And then the question that Tim posed um, was in relation to, uh, in the context of the play, and there's the reference to the work that's done by key workers and probation officers when working with offenders around um, victim awareness and victim empathy. And this is connected with my earlier point about harm where in working to um, support, support and motivate offenders to change, the important piece about addressing the harm. But there is a level where bringing the victim into the room uh, physically, obviously that's not going to happen in many cases. But in it is important that in addressing that harm, there are the opportunities um, can be raised at that point about the possibility of a restorative intervention. Um, and again, that will only happen if there is full and informed consent from all parties and obviously in particular from the victim. I think there are my three pieces that I can say at this point, Paul, and I'm happy to come back again if there's any further. Yeah, I, I, thank you so much, Ursula. Very, very interesting. Um, I think we should hand over back to Tim now, if Tim is ready to go. Uh, are you ready to go, Tim? Yes, I am. Um, great apologies for the technical problems. Can you hear me and see me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Good. So I gather, uh, I just heard that uh, Judge McNamara and Ursula Fernie have spoken. So is that right so far? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll ask uh, Nolan a question. Nolan Blackwell um, is the CEO of the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre. So, Nolan's organisation is working with these cases every day, and is, you know, knows more about the experience of victims than probably anyone else. 
So I'm interested in knowing because what, what I would acknowledge is that uh, the connection of restorative justice and gender-based violence in general is a highly controversial area mm -hmm. uh, for a variety of reasons. So I'm interested in your views of, uh, of, of that sort of matching this, you know, form of harm uh, and its particular nature with the restorative process and uh, what are your views and do you think it is possible to have safe and, you know, victim-oriented restorative justice um, in cases of, you know, rape and similar sexual violence? So if I were to give you a short answer, Tim, I would say I think it's possible, but is it easy? I would say no. Uh, that, that our sense is it's not easy. What I found interesting about today was that it showed three people, uh, your Janice, your to her husband, uh, Rob, I think I'm all right, Jeff, Rob yes, is her husband, yeah. and, uh, and you have Damon, who, who is the young student who commits the crime. The crime. And it showed the way that the way that justice never, never, never uh, showed them. It, and I'm getting feedback myself. I hope audio is okay for everyone else. But um, it, it showed them in a way that you, they could never be shown in court. In court, everything is distilled down, packaged. In that particular case, Janice was particularly annoyed and, and upset that because of a guilty plea, she didn't get... I wasn't sure was that she didn't get an explanation, which she very often wouldn't from the defendant anyway, or she didn't get to show that it wasn't going to define her into the future. So, uh, so, so restorative justice, like the plague, has that capacity to tell the stories that otherwise couldn't be told. And I have a big but coming straight after that. Because in the area of sexual violence, as far as we know in Ireland, and it's reflected similarly around the world. Most of the, the crimes of uh, most sexual offences are committed by someone who is known to the, to the subject of the crime, to the person who's the victim of the crime or the survivor of the crime. And we don't make any, we, ha we don't say what these people should be called who have experienced sexual offences some people want it recognized that they are victims of a crime. Some people want it recognized that they've survived it. And some people want something much bigger. And that, and that injured party that Judge McNamara, Patricia McNamara spoke about goes to that as well. So there's no perfect way of describing this very disparate group of people. But one thing we do know is that time after time, it is someone known to the person who experienced the crime who carried it out. And that brings its own problems, because I might be very happy to have someone try and explain to me why they stole my car, um, or, or that I wanted to explain to them the impact of that, because there's a, there's a good, well, of course, it can happen, someone you know does it, but it's more likely, actually, that a stranger will do it. So, so much crime is done by somebody who's not important to you. Year after year, our statistics show that 20% of the sexual um, offences or the sexual violence that we are dealing with uh, when we're working in the healing space, 20% of those is by um, a partner or an ex-partner. And in terms of people who are abused as children, 50% of those every second person who suffers abuse as a, sexual abuse as a child has it inflicted on them by an immediate family member. So look at what you're looking at in those cases. In those cases where somebody is well known, it's a family member, it's a, somebody you work with, it's someone who's in your social group. It is extremely disruptive type of crime to talk about at all. And it tends to involve a significant abuse of power. Now, if you take that then into the space of mediation or restorative justice, for those even who want it, the level of preparation that is needed to manage the uh, and to ensure that somebody is ready to 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 confront all of the um, all of the harm that has been caused by the crime by the abuse of trust, by the manipulation that may have gone on of the, of the person who experienced the crime, by the abuse for years and years. So in this particular area, there is just 
It will be for some, and it is useful as a tool for some, but not unless in the area of intimate crime, sexual violence, sexual violence. domestic violence. Domestic. In these cases, there must be proper preparation, preparation. proper understanding, and people must not be put into it simply to get past something or other. There will be pressure on people to go into restorative justice um, situations, like Ursula said, before, before someone's coming out uh, into a community, perhaps after a sentence. But the person who has experienced the crime may not want that, but the abuser's family may want it because the person's going back into the same community. So there are so many complications in this particularly traumatic area of crime by a known and an often trusted person that we, we, have, we have our doubts that there will be the level of support, preparation, preparation. And, and, and proper professional understanding given to make it anything other than a very niche area, at least for the time being. Thank, thank you very much, Nolan, for a very comprehensive answer and a different perspective on this, uh, which is really useful. Uh, Jeff, you're, you wrote the um, and I, I find it very very impressive and beautifully acted. Um, could you just give us a bit of background? How did you come up with the idea? How did you? What was your process of sort of research to get it? You know, I thought you know you you know I think Nolene was acknowledging that you really captured some of the experience of the victim, um, and you know how did you get that and and. And just as a matter of interest, did you, in part of your research, observe any restorative justice in cases? You know, actual, you know, actual um, meetings. Oh, well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll address that last question uh, first. Um, no, is the answer. I, I didn't. I wasn't uh, fortunate enough, I suppose, to, to, to observe in person uh, such a meeting. Um, like many, like perhaps, many perhaps involved by. Uh, did see Alan Gilson's film, um, The Meeting, which uh, in some way in, provided some information uh, maybe that I, I wasn't already familiar with. Um, but I I, um, I suppose some, some it, it was, I was, I was supposed to mostly the, the information I kind of drew upon was what was passed on to me by um, a woman in the UK around whom this, this story kind of evolved or emerged. Um, it was inspired by by true events. So as I mean, I I, I, I traveled over to the UK twice to meet her and hear her, her story and what she'd been through. And uh, so I, I was guided by that very much. So um, and 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 in addition to that, I suppose I I also drew upon my own experience teaching creative writing one day a week in the Midlands prison and uh, also workshops in other prisons. But I suppose I was familiar with that 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 territory, but but in particular, I suppose the perspective that the fellows that I would meet inside, would meet would have inside. about their own crime um, and what they'd been through. And I was anxious to portray uh, maybe a, a, a story of this kind anyway from a different uh, point of view to 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 capture, to capture. Um, the the of, of person offended has has experienced and, and and how they overcome that that the trauma of that experience um so i'm not sure if i'm answering this these in sequence yeah. or, or, or in, in uh backwards going through the, the 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 questions that you've put to me um but but yeah so i, I suppose i was i, I wanted to, to um, convey that as, as best I could uh, um, and the notes that I had the, the, the people I've, I've spoken to uh, both in um, criminal circles and legal circles uh, my own partner she she was a former barrister and currently uh, uh, is writes crime novels uh, so her her own uh, she was able to provide valuable support and and, and advice on certain matters. I spoke to uh, a detective uh, as well um, about certain procedural elements, um, and, uh, and and I suppose the experience of teaching one-on-one -on -one at times to to fellows inside in uh, in prison um, 
gave me kind of some insight into into that and uh, the experience that Jan, Jan has uh, as her role um, in the the school that she, where she taught. Um, so I suppose so I suppose it's a combination it's a of things. Uh, um, without having without the the opportunity to sit through um, uh, a restorative justice meeting uh, per se, um, I, I think I, I was able to couple together anyway en en enough to try and steer it through carefully with sensitivity and uh, and show what um, what's involved in the, in the build up and also the, the benefits to both parties of, of, of that involvement. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I mean, certainly from my point of view and my experience as a practitioner and academic, I thought you succeeded in doing that very well. Um, Ian, um, Nolene has sort of, you know, put down a pretty big challenge to people who support restorative justice and particularly would like it to see it, you know, develop into more serious crime and harm. Uh, what, is, what does the research say about um, this area, particularly serious harm and particularly um, sexual violence? Um, does, it, does it generate good, good outcomes for, for the, the, both the victim and the perpetrator? And um, has it identified the sort of risks that Nolene has talked about from her experience? Yeah, thanks, Tim. So I suppose a lot of the research focuses on three areas, one of which is around the fact that this is happening on the books and off the books all over the world, often because victims are seeking it um, in the absence of it being offered to them. And Marie Keenan and Estelle Zinstein's work looking uh, at its use in Europe, for example, in countries where it's, it's not offered not formally, where it's not allowed, still people are seeking it and they're being supported to have those conversations by independent practitioners and by the third sector. So I don't envisage a regulatory framework in which it won't happen. And I would prefer to see a regulatory framework in which it's brought in to the mainstream so people can be fully supported, so that standards can be ensured, data can be collected on outcomes. Another area of research is around, I think one of the things you're getting at is can it meet the needs of the parties? Mm -hmm. We know that uh, victims of sexual violence are systematically uh, doubly victimized by the criminal justice system. And I fully agree with the risks and the concerns Noeline has. And what I think, you know, Dublin Rape Crisis Center and other um, third sector organizations also do a good job of is trying to hold the criminal justice system to the same standards, because we know that it is that, that traditional criminal justice is very, very victimizing and has a really negative experience on huge numbers of victims of serious violence. Um, in terms of whether criminal justice meets needs around voice, validation, participation, regaining control, moving on, there is good evidence that restorative justice can meet those needs for some people and criminal justice tends not to. And then the third area of research is around this balance in implementation and what a lot of, I think, researchers are talking about is the importance that experts in gender-based violence are heavily involved in the design of these services so that it can be ensured, conscious of the fact that gender-based violence, for reasons Nolene described, the dynamics, the power imbalances, it is different to other types of violence, and therefore people with lots of knowledge about that need to be involved. Normal restorative justice may not be good enough in these cases. So we need to make sure the training, the procedures are sufficiently evidence-based and sufficiently informed by the knowledge that has been developed over time and gained over time by, you know, organizations like Nolene working with victims in those situations. Now, that being said, just to reflect on the play itself uh, for a couple of minutes, if I may, um, given the party's needs as articulated, it was a very good example, I believe, of a dialogue that should have been facilitated rather than barriers put up 
at every point. point. Um, the way that Janice described why, why she wanted it, she said, there are things I want to say to him. There are questions I want to ask him. And I don't have huge expectations that I'll feel victimized if they're not met. I just want to say and ask these things. He was okay with it. Um, you know, I think that is a good example of why it should be uh, available to people in those situations. People should be given the information and the opportunity to decide if it's right for them. There should be safe services. And I agree with Nolene in a sense that one of my concerns is that the criminal justice system, when it gets its hands on this, it's not guaranteed to deliver it well because you know, court also in theory should sort things out and it doesn't, right? So I think there is a problem there. Also in relation to the play, I think it really brought to the fore the fact that lack of knowledge about restorative justice is a barrier, not just the fact that the police officer who gave her the um, flyer doesn't really get it, but her own victim liaison officer and even the teacher in the prison is trying to get him not to do it. So everyone around them, she's trying to explain to them that she wants to talk to the guy and every single person is telling her, you don't realize that you don't want to do that. So I think uh, there needs to be a bit of more knowledge there could be helpful. And I think there's a broader point if it's okay to say about the way that we treat victims of serious violence in society. And I do think that attitudes are changing insofar as we are beginning to see the importance of fair and respectful treatment for people who have suffered really serious violence. It's more than just a witness. It's someone who deserves resources to be invested in making sure they're okay or helping them cope and recover. But at the same time, we are yet to see those resources being invested. Um, and a lot of the victim services in Ireland are not rolled out nationally. Even in the um, play itself, I mean, everyone around her is basically trying to be compassionate, the detective, her husband, but they just don't know what they're doing because no one has explained to them. We have decades of research into the possible physiological reactions, the possible psychological and emotional reactions someone might have to being you know, harmed in that way. And no one, you know, th there's just no service that explains to the husband, you know, if she doesn't want to talk to you right away, that's, ex we understand, you know, you should maybe expect that and that's not your fault. So just, you know, chill out a little bit. Maybe she doesn't want to touch you immediately, right? Or even the detective, you know, everyone is just compassionately trying to say, in in they're intuitively trying to say what they think she wants to hear. And you could see that none of it was ever what she wanted to hear. And so I would love to see this investment in victim services, whereby there's someone in place there to explain to everyone, you know, what is likely or possible to happen and how they can, you know, strategically based on evidence rather intuitive than intuitively actually be compassionate to her and try and help her to cope and recover as much as possible. That's me there. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, Ian. Uh, does, Noling, did you want to respond? I can't hear you. Are you on mute? Yeah, someone needs to unmute Noling. Can you unmute Noling? We're losing a lot of. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, the host has unmuted me now. I think you can oh, hear great. me now. Great. I had yes. unmuted myself, but it wasn't good enough. I was being controlled from behind. <laughs> but just, uh, just a, a couple of things um, occurred to me. Uh, I went to this yesterday as well with my colleague Shirley Scott, who's our policy manager. And uh, we both said, after there's, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, in, uh, and this is actually something the criminal justice system is trying to do, and that is 
to ensure that we can accompany people to court. Bad as it is, it's a terrible system. It is traumatizing. Ian's 100% right about that. But we would often go to court where we do an awful lot of the explanations and she would have been prepared for things like the guilty plea uh, uh, and whatever. So, But that's a side point. The other point that I think that I should have made earlier, um, uh, and that is that Rob, the husband, is a victim of the crime as well. And he... Um, he needed to be part of that restorative process as well. And I'd really love to know from Jeff, like at the end of it, I was kind of disappointed that he was left out of the process. Whereas I think in a real restorative justice process, he would have been included. In fact, it didn't restore the relationship between Jan and Rob at the end. Well, I suppose it's, it's a little bit ambiguous at the end. I suppose the intent... On our part, anyway, um, Paul and I both uh, discussed this at length uh, during rehearsal. Uh, that 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 there's a, an intimation there that um, that she's well, first of all, that she's about to to speak, about to explain why she's been so reticent or or secretive, um, and then he kind of interrupts that. But but I suppose I, I'd like to think that maybe at, by the end that. The assumption is there, or the inference is there, that that when they do travel, or these that conversation is is imminent, um, and and that of course she regrets leaving him out of the whole process, the engagement process, but felt it was a decision she needed to make, uh, that she needed to um, achieve that kind of resolution, uh, and he wasn't supporting her at, 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 at various different times um in some way it reflects what what the case that i that i um the, the woman i met in in the uk and what happened within her within own her. Uh, that there was some some things you know there were similarities to that i, I think um but we we certainly uh maybe maybe emphasize that or at least uh, uh, what, not not so much for dramatic effect, but it but it kind of it felt like the the, the that that Rob was was not was not not so much hindering her engagement in the process, but well he was to begin with certainly, and and I think it it was very much a journey that she needed to take and that one that she felt more empowered by, um, uh, and it did threaten their their marriage. I suppose it did did have a huge impact on their marriage, uh, but she felt that, um, I suppose that could be, I suppose, I suppose we, we, where we need it, is the sense that the, that marriage will 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 be will continue to be intact, and and that their relationship will begin will begin to flower and improve again. Yeah, th thanks, Jeff. I'm just wondering, Peter, um, have we got any questions from the audience yet? Hear me? Do we know? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can, Peter. Have we? Um, the panel are doing such a wonderful job that they're covering a lot of the questions already that people might have been uh, thinking of putting okay. in. Uh, th there's no immediate list of questions or comments in as yet. I mean, okay. what, what is obviously just for myself and observing is it's bringing up all the key pieces and elements yeah. and dynamics. It really is. A, it's a it's a wonderful conversation to sit back and just listen to. Really enjoying it. Um, bringing up the issues of victim participation, volunteerism, uh, secondary victimization, the importance of preparation, uh, language. It's all in there. It's excellent. I'm really enjoying it myself because I'm usually maybe sitting on the other side, but really enjoying it. Um, the other issue that was really interesting that came up, particularly for far more, and um, what we might call the higher tariff offences, where individuals are being incarcerated for a while. Is that on one second, you have the victims who are, you know, probably, you know, they're, they're relieved that the person has pleaded guilty and they do not have to go to the, uh, you know, the, uh, the trauma of going to a full trial. But also in our experience, when we've talked to victims who've come to talk to us with regard to uh, exploring restorative justice, one of the reasons they give for they wanting to participate or initiate such a process is that they never get to engage or hear the offender's contribution in the court because on a guilty plea, you know, they, they don't have to, to give evidence. So that was that was really interesting to hear that. So the victim was getting the satisfaction of hearing the offender taking responsibility, but also then 
their need for more information and the engagement of some kind with the offender. They didn't get that. And that in turn led them to come later on in the process looking for some kind of engagement and facilitated dialogue dialogue with the offender. So that was kind of really interesting for me to hear because it kind of backed up uh, my own experience. Yeah, th th thanks, Peter. Ursula, did I see you signaling to speak? Uh, thank you, thanks, Peter. Thanks, Tim. I um, There were two or three points. I, I, I've gotten gone off on another track now, but just to go back to the ending, I think um, for me, the ambiguity was understandable because restorative justice is not a magic bullet. It doesn't undo harm. The harm, that sort of harm that has been done cannot be undone. It is about being able to uh, allow an opportunity for certain aspects of that harm to be, to be restored or respond specifically to the needs of the victim. And in this case, that was well articulated why uh, Jan needed to to have the meeting. Um, and I think from my own experience and experience of colleagues, um, you know, Nolan is quite right. I think when at all possible, the involvement of family members and a partner like that is so important. So important. But the person may choose for whatever reason to, to go it alone or maybe with a, a different support person. So I think it's, my next point then is really around um, you know, the, the importance of the awareness so that people can make a choice. And that's why, again, the need not to hurry a process or for the agendas to be left outside the door. And, and we all know the importance of that objectivity to ensure that the, um, the people involved, the person harmed and the person who's done the harm can make a about motivation and purity of motivation there's a lot of big challenges there and that's why i thought the play was very helpful in and and obviously there's limitations to what one can portray but looking at the preparation process which you know say in the film that you suggest we don't see the preparation we don't know how those two people got we get a snapshot of it in in the in in stronger and i think that's really important about the preparation the opportunity to disengage um at any point in that process and the opportunity um to allow um you know just to make sure that the person has the full unbiased information and we have to be so aware of our biases if you know you one is a supporter of justice or one is less supportive of restorative justice time it is about a process and it's not about wrapping everything up into a nice little package and it's all sorted that that can't happen i just if i may tim want to say that in relation to an earlier point i made around um victim initiated i am going to use the term victim i know we have discussed that survivors initiating um a contact with themselves and the probation service um it, it was the the process was um in response to to their requests as opposed to um perpetrators who were on the point of release um i, I may not have been clear enough sure. but it was just a response to something nolene said earlier and um, it was uh, it was the, the cases we have been working with are directly in response to, to victims Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Peter, I see there's a couple of questions coming through now. Yeah, there's a couple of pieces coming in, Tim, and one is with regard to rationale uh, for a victim's motivation perhaps coming into the process. And uh, it referenced just in talking about, you know, uh, the voice being heard and validation. Being so, uh, so it does it reference a uh, request for Tim or Ursula, but I'm sure all the panel could talk about uh, around rationale. You know, is it just enough to be heard and to be in the room with the person or do people need, you know, tangible and real answers? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that wasn't it. That was a question I had in my mind because uh, in the play, those of you who have seen it, Janice, uh, when she meets Damon uh, for a restorative meeting, um, says, I want to know why. Why did you do it? 
and he doesn't actually answer that question. So I felt a little frustration, but then I'm, I'm doing research at the moment into victims of serious harm who have experienced restorative justice. And one of them said something that I thought was very profound. It's not so much getting answers to your questions or finding answers to your questions. It's more losing the questions. Um, and, and several victims have said, I had a whole lot of questions prepared, but when I went into the meeting, I didn't ask them and it didn't matter. It's, it's, it's getting rid of the questions in your mind that have tortured you uh, for months, if not years, that I think the meeting, and I think, I don't know if that was Jeff's intention in that, um, but it seemed eventually not to matter to Janice um, that she didn't get her answer, but maybe she did get the answer when, when he said, you know, what I did was wrong, you yeah. know. And I'm very, very sorry. Maybe that was enough. Um, does anybody else have a, a response to that? Um, does anybody, you know, have any frustration that Janice never got the answer to why? Anyone else? I, I don't know if Jeff wants to, to comment, but I, I noticed it as well, Tim, because I was interested to see what was going to come from, from the mm -hmm. why. Um, but like you, suddenly it didn't seem that important and uh, again i think um, it is it it is a, a common question you know why me mm -hmm. um or why do it um and I, I, what seemed to be you could interpret if one wished about the drawing and the significance and the feelings that came up and past traumas and different things mm -hmm. but what there is something about um i think needing the perpetrator the person who's caused that harm to know how tormented the uh, victim has been by it happening and how that question has reverberated um the why questions are often very difficult to get a, a clear concrete response because for some of the complexities that, that Nolan described earlier, it's not as straightforward as, if you want to put it that way, as stealing a car. You needed a car, you needed to whatever. And um, so I think the, um, I, I, I certainly find that very interesting what you're saying from your research, Tim, that it's about mm -hmm. losing the question. The question. Mm -hmm. And it's often about having, I, I think the, the important piece about being able to tell your own story as to the impact of the harm on you, which from the victim's perspective hasn't happened in the criminal justice system. So it moves away from the request to, to share and to give that impact. Hmm. Jeff, do you have any comments in that scene why Janice didn't get a straight answer and yet seem satisfied enough to say, I forgive you? Um, Yes, well, uh, I, yeah, I deliberately didn't want to clear that answer. I, suppose. Um, I think he, he, he was probably still working through it himself and probably would have left the room trying to perhaps even perhaps consider what, what it was, the impulse, if, if it was down to any one thing. I think it was a combination of factors, uh, and we kind of raised those during, during the play. Um, but uh, for, for, for Jan, it, it was given the personal nature of, I mean, I suppose the, the personal relationship that she'd had with him and uh, how she had um, had hopes, high hopes for his his uh, schoolwork, his, his artwork, um, that, that she she just wanted, to, I think, how you put it yourself there, Tim, you know, that she just wanted to sit opposite him and hear him talk, hear, hear him trying to, to tackle the questions um, that particular one, why it, it, come, it, it comes up several times during the play. Um, and I suppose I, I quite like the idea that, that maybe audience members would have left and tried to kind of figure out which one moment or, or um, factor was the principal cause of, of that attack that, that she had to endure. Um, uh, I, I quite like the fact that 
it isn't explicitly answered um that instead there's a, there is resolution for her but but it's it's more um i don't know it's, i suppose it's something that isn't quite um articulated, articulated. Mm. thanks there, there is some follow-on there uh tim just to say what we're going to, uh, to what we've been discussing um, yeah which is kind of a question around, you know, the regaining or retaking of agency, or the regaining of control. Um, yeah. And that in that case, maybe that was the important thing for Jan. Um, yeah. And uh, just and just a follow on comment as well for Fanula, just thanking the panel uh, for addressing mm -hmm. your question so well. Um, there is a kind of an information question there, and I'm not quite sure who might handle that. It's just with regard to the provision of um, restorative justice services for serious crime. Um, and that's whether that can be answered by one or all of the panel. Yeah, I mean, that's a fairly factual thing. I think just asking what in Ireland is available if uh, a victim wants a restorative service, presumably, um, what, what is available? I know, Peter, you could probably answer that as well. Well, one of the interesting things I thought about that question, I mean, was in the context of uh, defining what a serious crime. And I always think it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's the context of how the victim feels. We do, you know, there is a kind of a, maybe people might see a hierarchy or what they consider maybe low tariff or higher tariff. But in the context of, you know, what is serious crime, I think this person is asking with regard to uh, maybe the higher tariff crime. Certainly for our own service, um, and our, our sister service in Nina, which is we're both funded by the probation service. We take uh, the majority of our cases from the district court, and we also get circuit court cases for a uh, circuit court case for referrals. And um, and uh, uh, the restorative just the justice in, in the probation service. But it is an interesting piece in terms of um, what people categorize as serious. But it really depends on. You know the impact on the individual where we've experienced people who might have had what people might consider a simple you know you know uh, a wallet snatch or a snatch or a mirror or something on the car but that impacted them so significantly because it might have impacted on their ability say with the car to get to work which means, work. To work, which means it impacted on their financial uh, you know income and stuff like that uh, so that's kind of that, that that's kind of an interesting kind of take on it yeah, yeah. Could, I, I wonder, could I, is an issue that I, that I thought about when I was, you know, watching the play, and I thought, Jeff, you wrote about this beautifully, and I thought, Paul, Paul your, your directing and your staging really reflected it, because here was, Janice was navigating her way through the system, um, trying to get some sort of satisfaction from the police, the trial, the, the punishment in prison, uh, the liaison officer, and feeling all the time frustrated. And this is what I took from it, and, and it has been reflected in some of the things that victims have told me, is that when, you're, when you've been a victim of serious harm, particularly of a sexual nature, because there's an intimacy involved in it, that the system and the family find it very difficult to talk about. They don't want to talk to you about it. They don't, they want to comfort you. They want to protect you. They want to, you know, find the culprit guilty and put him in prison, but they don't actually want to address the experience. And what interests me is there was a lot in the staging, and I don't know if this was done consciously, Paul, of tidying things away into cupboards. Um, I was fascinated by that, that quite often a scene ended with people putting, now obviously you need to tidy up the stage, but it's like the system tries to do that and the family tried to do that. The husband felt deeply and, and loved his wife, but didn't want to talk about it, wanted her to move on. Said, look, let's go out and meet our friends. You know, distraction is good. And, and the system does that, you know, catches the perpetrator and tidies him away for a while. Um, so we don't have to think about it. 
And I, I don't know if that was your intention, but I just it just really stood out because that's often what victims said say to me. Nobody wants to talk with me about what happened. They want to, you know, give me therapy. They want to keep me safe. If they give you know, all good things, me support. They want to punish the offender. But my feelings, the mixed feelings, the the relationship I have with the offender is is sort of just get over it, move on. Um, I, you know, I'd welcome Paul and Jeff's views on that, and also anybody else who has uh, can connect that issue of how the system, the family, don't really address the experience of harm. Of course, I think the restorative process does, but that's, that's another note. Paul, Jeff, were you consciously thinking about that? Do you want, do you want to go first, Paul? Um, well, while, while he's on mute there, I mean, I suppose there's one uh, very, very, very early on in the the second act. Um, she she does make that comment. She's she, to uh, before she storms she out of the, the room with the, when she meets with the guard liaison officer Paul. She she comes to the realization herself almost in that moment that for her it's never been about the sentence. It's it's something greater. Um, uh, and it's about yeah. Re, I suppose um, regaining some sense of control of her life, um, being able to before she can move on herself. That that you know, I suppose ultimately that that's what the meeting does for her. It does provide her with that. Um, but but maybe Paul, you want to talk about uh, the, the, the the locking away of certain items? Yeah. And, well, I mean, there is there is a practical aspect to that, as, as you said, Tim. But but I think yeah. that uh, our set designer Marie Kearns, who thought very deeply about the play, so much so that so so the set design a number of times to, you know, as, as the play evolved and also as, as our ideas about it evolved. But she did think about how things are tidied away and the, how how clean uh, the characters, particularly Rob, might want the apartment to be. And, I mean, that is in the text, and she drew that from the text, from Jeff's text. And... I think it was the, the psychology of the characters. I, think it, it, I mean, I, I didn't think about this, I have to admit, but uh, I think you did pick up on something that Marie sort of embedded in the design, which is the, a desire to tidy things away and, and everything in a bow and in a knot and, and to sort of not address it fully and not engage with it fully. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really good observation of yours. And, mm -hmm. and I think Marie, instinctively and through her work on the text um, created that within the, the world of the set. Mm. So that, that's why you think about it. Any comments? No, Lane, I see you. You want to speak. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I, I think that's right. Actually, one of my fears for a restorative justice process in some ways that's that's not well designed enough is that it also will be used as a, a way of tidying things away. Um, in a previous life, I did a lot of private family law um, and, uh, and mediation was the thing. And if Patricia McNamara doesn't mind my saying so, a judge loved it when somebody came along and said, uh, we have a mediated agreement because that was nice and tidy. But literally, I was doing a with some law students uh, last month, and one of them had come across an old mediated agreement for somebody, and he said he hadn't been able to work out why it was that somebody would sign such a bad agreement for themselves. And, and it was only in the context of what I was talking about, which was the, the trauma and the, the damage to a person's most innermost self to their dignity to their sense of self-worth and everything that people can be pushed into a mediation agreement and that and that is in in mediation i saw in those areas exactly the same um dy power dynamics that had maybe made the marriage fail in the first place so if restorative justice is done well and the supports are in place and if the perpetrator has insight, because again and again, I hear in sexual violence cases, serious ones, the perpetrator had limited insight into what they were doing. Now, 
if it becomes a, a, a way of giving the perpetrator insight, uh, that, that's going to be hard work on the person who experienced the violence. So I would worry about it being used as a way of, another way of tidying away. But, but definitely I see the value of it when it's well told. And, but it's also what restorative justice isn't the only thing that can do that. I mean, that's also what therapy is about. And for instance, people would say to us, why can't people just live with six sessions of therapy? for instance, after sexual abuse, surely that's enough. Whereas my therapist would tell me that depending on what a person comes into the room with or how they are fixed at the start, therapy can be a very long, very painful process before a person is healed and empowered, or heals uh, and is empowered, empowered given the goal of their life. So it's, yeah. it's, not, it's not to deny what you said, it's just, it, 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 it just, it I suppose my worry my isn't worry. about restorative justice. It's about doing it really well in areas where abuse of power lies at the heart of so much of a particular type of violence. Yes. No, I, no, I, I agree with you, Noreen. Um, I mean, two things in, in my research. Most of the victims have had ther therapy as well as restorative justice. So it's not an either or. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, there's no doubt that restorative justice tries to tidy things up too. There's no doubt about that in my mind, and certainly in my research into practice. Um, we try to get a neat scripted approach to a, a very complex situation. Um, uh, so, so I agree with that. Uh, I see uh, Patricia wants to, wants to speak. Am I on mute? No, you're fine. Okay, I have to come back listening to Nolene, of course, and and others. I made a couple of. There's an echo, is there? Is everybody else unmuted? For a start, I'm a firm believer that restorative justice can work well within the criminal justice system. I use it. What is important, and I take on board what you're saying, Nolene, but what's so important here are well-qualified, experienced mediators. And every case, and this is within whatever kind of crime, is different. Every circumstance is different. Every victim, injured party, survivor is different. Every offender is. And they all have particular needs, backgrounds, etc. And of course, it's pleaded. Say you hear about the offender mitigate circumstances. But within the criminal justice system, and again, it's already been said, it's with consent of both parties. It has to be fully informed consent. And if they both agree to go within it, the trained mediators, and I find the restorative justice reports that come out to me, Nolene, will say the offender has limited insight. Well, then, restorative justice isn't for this person, you know, or it's not working, or restorative justice might say, but we feel progress is being made and he or she should do such and such a program. So we're in restorative justice, you have programs, for example, and this is through probation as well, um, like uh, anger awareness, drug awareness, um, overcoming violent emotions programs. And so somebody can, can go and do that. And one thing that comes through from the report too, uh, through the whole process, is whether the person has genuine remorse. All right, voice of the victim is included in there. Um, uh, a lot of victims, I think, and this point has been brought up by Ian, and I would uh, second this completely. And it, it comes out in the play a lack of knowledge and restorative justice. Uh, the husband didn't, couldn't even pronounce restorative properly. And I believe plays like this. If only we had more of them, if only we had TV programs, if only we had films, including restorative justice, then there would be better public 
awareness and they would come become normalized within the restorative justice, within the criminal justice system. So people aren't aware of it uh, very much. And I think the court I sit in, we're trying to give a lot, a lot more public awareness of it and the community. So if it's a crime against the community, community representatives are on the panel, um, you know, and uh, again, Peter uh, has said this, you know, you could have a simple theft, you know, simple, could be a laptop, and for someone, there might be anything on it, for another victim, it could be the, the last photographs they have of their daughter, for example, who's passed away. Another person, it could be the thesis that they've just done for submission, deadline, gone. So even something like a laptop, the consequences for a victim can be very different. But within the restorative justice process, this can come out and the victim's voice gets heard. And um, the offender has to face up and see what they've done, not only themselves, but to their family, if they want, if they want their family, somebody close involved, and again, for the victim who's affected within on their side of it. So that's where, in a sense, the play, the husband left out, I think, in normal circumstances. I, I, I'm not the mediator in the background, but um, I think whoever uh, may be affected or needs to engage, again, it's something between the two parties. And Nolene, it's probably how many years ago that you were using mediated agreements from the courts? quite some time, but now I think the mediators who uh, sit down with parties uh, within family, I, I would take down there, um, that again with the consent of the party mediators, that a thing about a mediated agreement is that hopefully it's done without animosity rather than going to court where for something like that there could be great animosity and a deepening of the hurt and a deepening of the division and maybe not the very best for the parties and their children if that happens but anyway did you hear all that it was a wee bit rough time my end but uh, i think we got most of it thank you okay. Patricia. so i think i've answered um, thank you Anything else, Peter, from the audience that we need to take in before we up? We've got about seven minutes yeah, left. Sorry, just a, a piece there from Jennifer, and it just ties into something that um, Nolene and the judge referred to with regard to the importance of, um, you know, the insight of the offender that they get a, you know, that part of the process will focus on raising their awareness and understanding uh, the consequence of their actions. And I think we're going to cover some of that. Uh, yeah. in our contribution here today. Yeah. Just on a, uh, on a, on a recent experience that uh, Jeff might um, kind of empathise, but we actually had a case, as the judge has pointed out most recently, of a young screenwriter um, who had a full screen uh, script on his laptop, which was stolen, and he had not backed it up on any disc. And uh, he desperately wanted to engage with the other person uh, who was apprehended. Uh, just to, you know, the, the, the laptop had a value of maybe 400 euros, but in actual fact, it was about two years of work from this young man um, who had no backup. No backup, backup and he was to, uh, just pass on the significance of the loss of this laptop to the, to the offender. One of the things that's coming out for me, and I, I want to bring you in on this, Ian, because I know we're, we're sort of working with Ursula and Karen O'Dwyer about sort of the rollout of restorative justice in Ireland um, is the importance of quality. Because I think what Nolene has raised um, is, is that, I think I'm getting a sort of concession from you, Nolene, that if it's high quality, very well done, a lot of attention to the safety of the victim and a real understanding about power dynamics and trauma 
that it's possible that restorative justice um, could be useful in this area. And I agree 100%. I don't think when we talk about restorative justice, it's not a general thing. I think anybody undertaking the sort of case that was portrayed in the in the play uh, stronger is is just not a basic trained restorative practitioner. They have specialist training on top of that uh, to understand our dynamics in, in sexual harm and domestic violence um, and the, the, tra the traumatic effect of such intimate violence. Um, so so it, it, for me, if restorative justice is to move in the direction that some of us wanted to, there must be a huge emphasis on quality and it isn't just used as, as I talked about and you, you talked to, to tidy up mess, messy situation, um, uh, to make, make things look better than they really are. Um, Ian, do you like to comment on the, on the notion of the challenge to deliver high quality restorative processes, particularly in complex and, and you know, more serious harm cases, uh, as we begin to contemplate in Ireland that we're going to have a, a nationwide service in restorative justice. Definitely. And this is why I think bringing it to the, into the mainstream is quite important, because in jurisdictions like New Zealand, for example, where restorative justice is very heavily legislated for, um, and there are comprehensive services, you also have government oversight of training and training providers. And that is that are standard around training as much as there are around practice. And we don't have that here. So I do think that there is an onus on training providers to adhere also to quality standards in training to ensure that the training that is provided is updated according to uh, evidence ongoing collection of evidence. And as you say, the people who facilitate in these cases, there's a number of things that, you know, as you say, it's difficult to show this all in a play, but best practice is co-facilitation. You would have two people delivering that. In addition to that, um, not only would people require training around the delivery of serious and complex cases, but it, they would also require training around what is sexual violence? What are the dynamics of sexual violence? And so, you know, there's a lot of investment to be done to ensure that quality, much as there is a lot of investment to be done to do other things around the criminal justice system that are resource intensive, but are more likely to meet victims needs. I would note, for example, that in New Zealand, there is paid leave for domestic violence, people who suffer domestic violence. And one of the things she talks about in the play is that, you know, her, her boss is bugging her to get back to work and she's going to have to, you know, or things like criminal injuries compensation. You know, the, people are fighting to get 20K for life changing injuries. And yet at the same time, we have no problem spending way more than that putting people in prison for a year, you know, which is in cases where that's just going to create more victims subsequently. So I think what restorative also can help us with is this reorientation of the justice system, this reorientation of where our resources go so that you start with people's needs and you invest resources on that basis. And as a criminologist, I always say, look at what's working well in other countries. Don't just copy the thing because countries are different, but we have all, there's loads of really interesting ways to respond to violence, to respond to victims' needs that exist all over the world that have not been implemented in full, but which we know would be very likely to improve uh, the situation for people in, in Ireland, say. Can someone unmute Tim there? Yes, I'm 
Thank you, Ian. Uh, I, I was just saying our time is just about up now. Uh, I was asking if anybody had one brief thing they wanted to say before we finish. Um, this is your opportunity. It needs to be brief. Well, Tim? Yeah, I see, I see you, I Patricia. Just, yeah. yeah, can I just say, within the criminal justice system, that restorative justice can run parallel to it. As well, as well, you know what I mean. Mm. Yeah, well, as was the case in the play. Well, yeah, in the play, the yes. the justice system was finished, wasn't it? The sentence. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, I think that's a really important point about the. Um, fact that the, the systems can complement each other and we need to I suppose that what's the messages that are coming out very strongly from the discussion is that we need to avoid and learn from, from previous um, errors that can be made or the siloing that can happen or the packaging and putting things away um, so I think so it's I that complementarity that's so really important that they can work hand in hand um, and I think what was the 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 sentence had finished, but restorative justice can operate, and this is something that's been looked at very carefully at the moment. And the, the opportunity for restorative justice can be used at many stages across the criminal justice system, pre uh, pre court as part of the court process and post sentence and onwards. And that would be, I think, a, a fantastic um, development. Yeah. Thank you. So I just see one question there. Can you elaborate on the nationwide restorative process service and the timeline for this? Um, it's just a short question, but it's, there's a big answer to that, I guess. And uh, I don't know, Ian, do you want to do a very quick overview of what's happening in restorative justice, but it really needs to be a one minute answer? Uh, it's used very little in Ireland currently. The Department of Justice has publicly committed to publishing a policy paper this year, which would, if implemented in full, result in services being developed so they could be used more widely. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we can uh, close the, the webinar now. And look, thanks very much to the unseen audience. Uh, and we've, we've followed your chat, but I hope you find this useful. Jeff, did you want to say a word? Well, I was just going to say that, yeah, I mean, hopefully the play helps to get the message out that it, it can be of uh, such benefit to, to people, that, that it is a process that, that um, deserves to be, to be listened to, to be, to be um, promoted and to be discussed in this way, hopefully, and, and that, 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 that it can help um, yeah. people to move on. And if there are seats available, I'd, I'd advise you to buy one. Um, even if you're not interested in restorative justice, it's a great, it's a great play. It's a really interesting watch. Uh, well, well recommended. Okay, well then let's close. Um, thank you to all the panelists and to Peter for um, checking out on the chat side. Uh, Paul, Jeff, Ian. Noling, Ursula, and Patricia, thanks for your contributions. I see very positive feedback coming in um, from the chat. So um, I think it's been very worthwhile. And um, just thanks for the opportunity to see this wonderful play. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Bye.